Ahoy, and welcome to the Jolly Reader. I'm your host, Captain Book. So this is part one of The Hand on the Wall by Maureen Johnson, which is the third book in The Truly Devious. But before we get to that, I have a special guest joining us. It's my first mate in life and on today's episode, my husband, Josh. So he's going to say a few words about himself, even though he really doesn't want to. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm Maria's husband, and we've been together for almost eight years, and we have a beautiful little girl and a bunch of furry babies that we take care of together, and (laughs) our life is pretty awesome, and I'm really excited to do this podcast with her today. Okay, so full disclosure, he hasn't read any of the books, and he has listened to all the episodes, and we've talked about it, and I vented constantly. But I haven't talked about this first part of the book, so all reactions are genuine. (gasps) (gasps) So anyways, today, like I said, we're covering the hand on the wall. Go back and listen to the past five episodes of the series, but I could probably explain it in one minute. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of the last two books. 1930s, Albert's bestie, Marsh, the FBI agent, planned the kidnapping of Iris and Alice because he had gambling debts. Boo. Uh, things got out of hand and a third unknown person took over and killed Iris. Marsh did kill Dottie. He knows what happened to Alice. After confessing, Marsh blows up the boat. Both him and Albert were on, killing them both, supposedly. Also, there's two kids, Frankie and Eddie, who wrote the Truly Devious Letter. The biggest of... Who cares? You gotta get closer if you're gonna add the who cares. <laughs> he was like a mile away from the mic. Okay, 2017. Stevie and David find Ellie's body in the secret tunnel under Minerva, which Captain Book called three books ago. I know there's not three books, but whatever. David finds out about the deal Stevie made with his dad, Edward King. Stevie figures out that March killed Dottie. There's a house fire at Fenton's house, which causes Fenton's death. Is there anything you want to say so far I haven't covered in the previous episodes? slash questions or theories Ooh, honestly i have heard a lot of your theories and i think that i still think that alice is alive or was alive up until a point i don't think that she she's like 90 now yeah maybe i don't know she could be like 90 now i believe that albert had no knowledge of what happened after that and i think that there are going to be some players that we haven't heard about that had more to do with this than what we think okay those are all good all good so my next section is things to look forward to which i totally didn't fill out so i'm just gonna like try to wing it here and now a snowstorm laptops (laughs) an art collective and maple syrup moose sign the moose sign that's my last one okay so Sounds like a raging party. (laughs) No squirrels this episode. So before the book starts, there's a thank you to a man named Dan who taught the author about Disneyland. I do not appreciate the million pages I had to read about Mudge in Disneyland that was pointless to the plot just because the author wanted to add something personal. I'm not about that life. So just like going into that. So also in the cover is the map of the school again, which I still have yet to use. Then it starts with the Federal Bureau of Investigation photograph image of the letter received at the Ellingham residence, April 8th, 1936. It's the truly devious letter that I've read seven times, so I'm going to make Josh read it this time. <laughs> Look a riddle, time for fun. Should we use a rope or gun? Knives are sharp and gleam so pretty. Poison slow, which is a pity. Fire is festive, drowning slow. Hanging's a ropey way to go. A broken head, a nasty fall, a car colliding with a wall. Bombs make a very jolly noise, such ways to punish naughty boys. What shall we use? We can't decide, just like you cannot run or hide. Ha ha, truly devious. Ha ha, truly devious. Okay, so how hard was that to read with the cutout letters? Um, Some of them are way too dark and... My mastery of the English language made them even more challenging. I'm convinced the whole purpose of the cutout letters was to make me feel uncomfortable reading it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we're going to start the book. December 15th, 1932. What can you tell us about the date December 15th? Well, (laughs) Captain Book, that was the due date of our little baby girl. Whose name is? Allison Rose. So this is also the date that 
Alice from the book is born. Isn't that yeah. ironic? Okay, but different years, obviously. So Albert and Leo, who's the artist, are at a Swiss retreat for privacy of the birth of Alice. And Albert is complaining because it's already been nine hours. Oh, yeah. Only nine hours? How many hours was it for you? Twelve. Was it too long for you to wait? Was that just like too much work for you? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I fell asleep right afterwards, so. (laughs) He really did. (laughs) Okay, so they're talking about that green clock on the mantle that the headmaster Charles has in his office now. And, oh, guess who would have guessed it? There's a hidden drawer underneath if you turn it over. That's where I think the will's hidden, but there's no confirmation of that. That's just my theory. So Albert, the baby's born. It's a girl. Duh. So Albert is like overly excited, like to the point where I felt uncomfortable about it being a girl. He's like, I knew it was a girl. I'm so excited. Of course it's a girl. And it's just like really weird. Like you should just be happy it's a baby. So (laughs) I'm not a dinosaur. So Alice, (laughs) Alice goes into, no, not Alice. She can't walk yet. Albert goes into the room and sees Iris holding Alice and he's saying how beautiful she is and Iris says oh she's ours and a woman asked to hold the baby her baby that she gave birth to don't look at my notes you're supposed to be surprised I would never look at your notes (laughs) I was looking at the wall the hand on the wall exactly okay so any guesses on who the mom is do you have any idea (laughs) I have absolutely no clue it's Flora what oh my gosh so flora's like can i hold the baby and iris is super sweet about it she's like yes darling yes of course like it's so important for you to bond with the baby or whatever like this is all a cordial adoption situation so albert and iris go into the hall and albert asks if flora has said anything about who the father is and she hadn't so i said my guess is that mob boss she worked for and then i said definitely whoever kidnapped alice and killed iris and then i said could it be eddie he'd probably be too young because he'd be like 15 but frankie describes him as being promiscuous and like hooking up with the maids and stuff and i said that could explain why david's sister is named alice and that would make baby alice david's sister's grandma in my theory so do you have any theories or that like about where how you feel i feel like that's about where i landed and the i don't know the mob boss thing makes sense just because you know the people that kidnap them probably have connections to people that would at least know him so that i don't know that all tracks well spoiler alert this book doesn't make sense and all those are wrong (laughs) so that's wrong because this book sucks this book is where everything is made up and the points don't matter, (laughs) if you get that reference. That's a good one. Okay, so then there is an excerpt from The Truly Devious, The Ellingham Murders. This is by Dr. Irene Fenton. So uh, nothing happens, but it confirms that enough of Albert and Marsh were found after the explosion, so they had to have died. Because for a while I thought, like, oh, maybe one of them lived or whatever to come back as, like, a plot twist. And then... It also says that people have come forward as Alice in the past, but with DNA analysis testing today, she might still be found. But that would imply that they'd have to have like Flora and or the father's DNA on file, which I just thought of. That could be a problem. But anyways. I mean, do they have like Alice's DNA from like... Well, the thing is like if Alice was found, how would you confirm with DNA testing that she is Alice Ellingham if she's not actually related to Albert? You wouldn't use his DNA to compare to. You'd use Flora and the fathers. So do they right. have Flora's? I mean that yeah, I mean but like my point being like if they took Alice's DNA because like she was obviously like within this wealthy family for like some reason. Like if they had her specifically oh, from to before compare, she got compared to herself. Right. Got it. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you'd just have like a two year old's DNA just for like happenstance. Hashtag hairbrush. Plus okay, DNA wasn't a thing. You're wasting time. <sighs> okay, cut. Maria, cut all this out later. (laughs) Okay, so then there's a Burlington News Online, November 4th. It's a local professor dies in tragic house fire. (gasps) We already knew that. The blaze began around 9 p.m. and believed to originate in the kitchen. Her nephew, Hunter, sustained minor injuries. We knew all that, but here we are. Chapter 1. This could, and probably is, pointless, is what my note says. But Stevie is in class, like picks his class, and they're talking about the donation or the donated skeleton, Mr. Nelson. Nelson is the last name of the 1930s house mother of Minerva. And Pick says that Mr. Nelson was probably from the mid to late 1800s. So that would make 
it like Mrs. Nelson's dad. If they're connected, literally never comes up. Probably pointless. But just like a tidbit, why would you name them the same last name? Anyways, Stevie has not slept and is keeping to herself because of three major things. What are those things? <laughs> Let me tell you. One, David, who she refers to as perhaps her boyfriend, he isn't even talking to her, okay? Like, they are not on speaking terms. Anyways, David paid to be beat up and put the video on Hayes' old YouTube. And I said, <laughs> remember Hayes? He hasn't mattered for, like, four episodes. <laughs> so if you need a refresher on who he is, like, go back to episode one or two because it's the only time he's talked about two dr fenton's dead in the house fire which i mentioned like six times already and three she quote unquote solved the ellingham case lol so stevie tells nate she solved the case i don't know why i have that in my nose because i feel like we already talked about this like a long time ago but anyway she says that dotty knew marsh which doesn't make any sense but whatever stevie then walks through albert figuring out that it was Marsh and Stevie solves the impossible riddle that doesn't make any sense. Where do you look for someone who's never really there? Always on a staircase, never on a stair. You take stair out of staircase. A case who's never really there. The person you hired to investigate, the one who's by your side, the one who you didn't think or even think to notice. So then I have answer me this. So I guess this will be directed at you, Josh. How do you make him never really there? It should be a person who's like Marsh is a person who is always there. So like the stair staircase thing makes sense, but never really there. Like as a guest, they say, but then he says, I'm a guest all the time. Like Flora is. Yeah. Like I feel like it could have been worded much better because like He's there, but like not noticed. He flies under the radar, Something which, uh, yeah, cool. but like never really there is like a huge Gumby size stretched, I love as it. somebody that I know might say. A very successful podcaster. Yeah, right. Okay. So, hey, to my five listeners out there, thanks for your dedication. So, I'm, and you and I are two of them. So Stevie then says that Fenton believed there was something in Albert's will that says whoever found Alice would go would get the fortune. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but now I just feel like that's how the book is. So Stevie refers to it like this theory as a real tinfoil hat grassy knoll stuff. But her theory about Marsh and the riddle isn't far fetched. But both situations are true in the book. But like the thought process behind it makes no sense at all. We're not going to waste any more time on this. So <laughs> Nate suggests Stevie tells the police everything. What? <laughs> Never. <laughs> so then Stevie says she can't tell the police because she doesn't know anything for sure. And what if it's all connected? Iris, Dottie, Alice, Hayes, Ellie, and Fenton? I said, real world, absolutely not. Crappy book? Probably. <laughs> you can laugh into the mic. It's fine. <laughs> So we have to confirm that I'm funny. So Stevie is losing her, her marbles is like what I have in the notes. And to cut out a bunch of what I read, like she's not showering. She's like acting really weird. She's not participating in stuff. Like she really is getting like Fenton psycho about this. So she's supposed to see a test run of Janelle's machine later tonight. I It's a stupid plot line that doesn't matter, but here we go. Nate's talking to her like, you need to go this thing. Like, are you okay? And she's like, I'm not okay. And then she like thinks about the old Stevie and the new Stevie. Like, I'm awesome. I figured out like who I am in a way and whatever. I don't, she's so stupid. This is like a waste of time. I'll probably cut all this. But anyway, she needs to talk to someone who loves to be challenged because she figured, figured it out or whatever. I, it doesn't make any sense. Spoiler alert. She's going to go talk to security Larry. I just feel like the book is half like actual mystery and then like half Stevie's journey of self-discovery into realizing that like she's a detective, you know, a detective or like sometimes more cool a than woman. she thinks she is. Man, I'm Stevie feels like a woman. <laughs> Okay, seriously, I wasted 10 minutes, like, recapping the last book because that's the first half of this book. Okay, so February 19th, February, February 19th, 1936, <laughs> Leo's outside painting the portrait that ends up above the stairs that is not the answer to the riddle. And Iris comes out asking him for cocaine, and he tells us she's a full-blown addict and is getting more from someone else other than him because he's like, oh, it's okay to take a little bit now and then because, you know, it's the 1930s, but, like, she 
she is like taking it all the time and like way too much apparently and he wants to take her back to new york to like basically go to rehab but he says albert would never have it like he doesn't like being away from iris and alice and he's like so albert probably is only having one affair instead of a bunch because he's so devoted to alice and iris so she being iris asks leo to find out from flora who alice's dad is and he basically says no he's like she's entitled to her secrets like you know i can't figure that out he figures it out he asks her like point blank later so anyways Frankie and Eddie come up to him after Iris leaves and they ask to take Leo's picture and he says yes, but he's like annoyed with him. It's like this whole thing. I don't understand why they did that. It's, uh, it, I don't, whatever. It happened, so I'm saying it. Chapter two. Dv goes to talk to Headmaster Charles under the pretense of talking about how she's doing with everything. She says she has to be careful because she doesn't cry, especially in front of teachers. She literally cried the entire second book, once very publicly on the sidewalk in front of Hunter and David. I mean, that's true, but it also seems like she deals with her emotions sometimes by just running. So cardio <laughs> could be her alternative. So she runs into Charles' office to talk about her feelings. No, okay. So anyways, she tells him she's struggling to process everything. So this is like her pretense. Like, I need information. So I had to be all sly. I'm processing everything with Fenton. But then she goes straight into asking about Albert's will. Like, it's clever. It's so stupid. Charles tells Stevie that some of the funds would have gone to Alice had she been alive. Those funds will be released. And that's how they're building the art barn and all the other construction, which I probably didn't talk about in any of the podcast. Stevie says, just like that, Fenton's theory went up in smoke, pun intended. And I say, why should I believe Charles? And it doesn't really discredit Fenton's theory. She said Alice would get it or basically, long story short, we already know what's in the will. If anyone can bring, we know Fenton's right, like a waste of time. Anyways. So question, like, wasn't there like a statute of limitations on this? If like they didn't find Alice by a certain amount of time, it was going to be released anyway. Because 18. (laughs) Yeah. So that was what, like 70 years ago? So why are we just getting the releasing of the money now? I think they found the will. I think the will is in the clock and then Charles found it. Like, I think there was no will and it was just like, it's in trust to the school. That's why they keep everything in the attic. It's because there's no point to any of this. That's why just leave it alone. Gotcha. So Charles and Stevie talk about how Edward King's a monster and I have, but why? Literally have no reason to think this. And like, Charles says it too. It's so weird. So then Charles asks if she's been in contact with David and she says no. Tomorrow, Hunter is being discharged from the hospital and will be conveniently staying in the Minerva house for a while since his house burned down. Isn't that just so convenient? Great writing. Mm. So he'll drive to his college campus when he needs to. But it says a million times in the other books that cars can't drive up there and that's why they have to take the little like trolley thing back and forth. But... No, it doesn't matter. I said, there's literally no effort put into this book. It always contradicts itself. But it actually makes perfect sense because the Minerva house is like half empty now because all of its students keep dying. That's why he's in there. Smart wit there. Okay. Charles gives Stevie... This this part's super weird too. Okay, you're going to die. So Charles gives Stevie a credit card to buy Hunter some things in Burlington because we have to give her a random reason to go there because no one's allowed to go to Burlington since David took off. And I said, I hate this. So he's like go pick out slippers and a coat and stuff for hunter because everything burned down and gives her a credit card is this like the movie blank check right now <laughs> like oh let's just give this kid like some random amount of money and just set him loose <laughs> and no one's allowed to go there because all the shady stuff and she's found two dead bodies but let's go <laughs> let her kill again yeah. stevie specifically like you couldn't find a more responsible student to do this or like a teacher like yeah. picks yeah maybe So anyways, and she talks about, oh, I don't know if this is in my nose, but she talks about how, oh no, it's coming up. I won't say it. So, so she texts someone, which I already told you it's security Larry coming to Burlington. Can you meet question mark? They respond when and where time to get some real info. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter three. (laughs) Okay. So here, here's the part I was going to rant about. Stevie does the shopping. Big who cares? That's five minutes of my life. I'll never get back if we're talking about the usage of slippers. She hates on slippers. Look at my feet right now. What am I wearing? You are wearing cat slippers. 
So Stevie needs to lay off on the slippers. She talks about how they're pointless. Excuse me? So anyways, she meets with ex-security guard Larry at a coffee shop. And she talks about how she doesn't like black coffee, but she doesn't want to spend money on creamer or something. I don't know, okay? Isn't creamer usually free? Yes. Okay, just checking. Okay, so... Anyways, Larry tells Stevie that Fenton left the burner on and lit a cigarette and then the kitchen was filled with gas, so it caught fire. And Fenton's, they explain it, she at some point lost her sense of smell, so it makes sense that she wouldn't smell like gas in the house. But also, if that was true, like, the house would explode. Like, if you had that much gas, it would it would be an explosion, not a fire. Yeah, if it, like, filled the room, like, yeah, you'd have a, you'd have a, I mean, I guess it wasn't sealed, but still, you'd get a pretty good explosion out of that. But supposedly it just caught the kitchen on fire, and then, like, Hunter tried to get to the kitchen, but couldn't, and he, like, got out however way, and then I said, literally the only thing I care about is all her cats survived because they went out the cat flap. Thank goodness. (laughs) I know. When the dogs died and we are liars, I, like, almost didn't finish the book. Yeah, by the way, if you're somebody that doesn't have a sense of smell and it's 2017, you should probably get an electric (laughs) stove so you don't have to worry about this. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so she considers telling Larry she solved the case of the century. And I said, technically, Albert solved it, but whatever. And she tells him on the phone at the end of the last book that she solved the case. Do you not remember that? She literally texts him or tells him, calls him, says, I figured it out. Fenton's not answering. I was trying to tell her. Oh, that's right. So inconsistency anyways but she doesn't tell him because you don't tell someone in law enforcement he's a security guard ex-security guard he's not even in law enforcement that you knew who committed one of the most infamous murders in american history because you found an old recording that had some strong hunches or she had strong hunches that's how you blow your credibility no stevie that's how you actually solve a case by sharing information if she really solved it why would it ruin her credibility i know i'm gonna have to like tune it down just for context, I was pointing at the screen where on the recording, the spiking of the voice recorder is ridiculous. She's screaming into the mic, I, literally screaming, and for good reason. I, t- I tune it so you guys don't bleed. Okay, so Stevie instead tells Larry that David was paid because he's like, there's something you're not telling me. She's like, okay, so David paid those guys to beat him up and upload the video. Big who cares? Now she thinks that David could have been so jealous of Hunter and her that he burned down Fenton's house. That's her theory. What? That's not what happened. Well, I don't know. I can't confirm who burned down the house, but... I mean, that seems a little egotistical, Stevie. That's all I'm saying. All about you. So she talks about David, and then Larry points out that David probably posts a video to get at his dad, which is news to Stevie... Even though the dad called her anyways, he wants Stevie to tell him if David gets in contact with her because he might be a danger to himself, especially after finding Ellie's body like he thinks he's unstable or whatever, which is not like far-fetched so stevie starts having a panic attack for no reason and runs to the bathroom and we get to hear about the breathing exercises that's called a cardio coping <laughs> mechanism i'm trademarking that right now tim tim so she comes out of the bathroom and notices something read page 44 okay i'm gonna let you read it burlington cabaret von da 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 Come see nothing, have a noise, dancing is mandatory and forbidden, everything is yum, (laughs) Burlington Art Collective Action House, every Saturday night, 9pm, you are the ticket. Sounds like someone had like a aneurysm while writing it and just like started (laughs) typing, everything is yum. Everything yum. Everything is achoo. (laughs) Okay, so anyways, so it's this poster and there's a picture of... Ellie on it. What? Why? I don't know. We'll find out. It's pointless. April 4th, 1936. Oh, great. My first note says, okay, I'm furious. Okay, this is the only part that I talked to Josh about previously. Okay, so this section, Frankie talks about her and Eddie making the truly devious letter. So at some point, they find this underground tunnel beneath a statue. And that's where they do most of their planning. So it's like literally a hole in the ground. And then they describe it as like inside as being like a grotto with like construction material. And it's underground and it's not like fully constructed yet. So I have in my quotes, in the vanishing stair, page 134, if you guys want to check, 
It says, quote unquote, for the actual construction of the letter, they lay together on the floor of the empty, newly constructed swimming pool, smoking and picking out letters. And I say the same pool room that Albert meets Mrs. Nelson. On page 34 of that book, it says, trailing along towards the still under construction gymnasium building, the room Albert Ellingham had entered was for the new indoor swimming pool. On the hand in the wall, page 47... Francis and Eddie had come down into their secret place once more. Eddie set up a ring of candles in the dirt. Page 50. The hideout was literally underground, under a rock. There was nowhere more private. This is where they now, all of a sudden, are constructing this letter. And I said, I literally cannot stand the inconsistency. Like, you wrote the book and repeated everything, but it changes each time it's stated. Yeah, it it does seem like sometimes it just fits the plot that's going on right now. Uh, And it doesn't seem like it was planned out as well as it should have been. So they might have been in a fully constructed, newly constructed pool, or they might be underground when they make the truly devious letter. Either way, it doesn't matter, but it's just, it's a principle of the situation. Okay, so long story short, they make the truly devious letter and then they have sex, the biggest of who cares. Frankie gets like back to Minerva and is looking through her notebook that had the first draft of the riddle. She puts it in the whole... I say that the red tin was eventually stored. That's wrong. But there's like a hole in her closet, which is like Ellie's room. I think. I think it's Ellie's room. I don't know who was in what room. But anyways, she she like hides it in her room. And then she notices something's missing. It's the secret pictures of her and Eddie dressed as Bonnie and Clyde. She thinks they fell out of her notebook when they were in the woods heading back to the dorms. That comes back around a little bit. Chapter four. Stevie goes to the location that was on the poster with a picture of Ellie on it. It's the Burlington Art Collective Action House. This is so drawn out. So she meets a girl named Bathsheba, but she wants to be called Bath. And bathtubs make her think of Ellie because when they first met, she was dying herself. I don't know, I'm not even going to finish my sentence. So a week after Ellie got to Ellingham, she found the art collective and they, of course, accepted her and befriended her. Apparently, Ellie talked very highly of Stevie and believed in her detective abilities. So now Stevie feels like a dick. Bath said that Ellie never really mentioned Hayes, just that she knew him and that his death made her sad, like made Ellie sad. She also says that David hasn't been to the art collective since last year because obviously they're friends, so they'd go together. And Bath says that she's sorry for everything Stevie has gone through, including the message on her wall. And this is like a quote from the book. Someone put a message on your wall. That was horrible. Ellie was so pissed about it. Stevie's response stupidly is like, uh, that was just a dream. I mean, is that not a little disrespectful to Ellie that, like, you know, basically you're telling this girl, like, oh, yeah, like, lied to her or whatever? No, she didn't tell Ellie. Like, she told Janelle, and she said, I think it was a dream because I was, like, waking up when I saw it. Ellie shouldn't even know about it. But, like, this person that you don't even know is talking about something that only you supposedly know, and you're like, that was just a dream. Yeah, that's, like, really weird. Yeah, so anyways, Bath says that it wasn't Ellie who made it and, like, made the projection and she seemed to know who did but didn't tell bath who did it so that's how ellie would have known about the projection because either hayes or whoever did it said hey i did this whatever Mm. i said we find the title of the book it's biblical so the hand on the wall so there's a feast this is like what's said in the book there's a feast and a hand appears on a wall and starts writing something no one can understand so i looked it up it's like an actual bible story So this king brings goblets from the temple and all his nobles and people like that drink from them. Then they praise the gods of silver and gold instead of like God that created Jesus. They call in David and he translates the inscription. I think it's just in Hebrew, so I don't know why no one can read it. So like it says three things. Your reigning days are numbered. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting and your kingdom is divided. And then the king is murdered later that night and like his kingdom's divided and all that. Just as a side note, though, just an FYI, in olden times, kings and queens were sometimes illiterate, and that's why they had scribes that would handle that kind of stuff for them. They never had a need to do it because they had, quote unquote, more important stuff to do. He called all the people of Babylon to translate it. It didn't work. He had to go get David. Okay, well, then David's (laughs) awesome. Well, it's Hebrew, so I bet no one there spoke Hebrew. I digress. So Stevie thinks that David wrote the message on her wall. 
for no real reason at all. And Bath says that Ellie was always talking about the walls and how there were things in them. Obviously, we know that. At some point, a hand had written on her wall. That's what Stevie says. I said, don't compare yourself to a biblical story, Stevie. You aren't that important. Is this supposed to be shocking to me that the message on her wall was real we already established this when she first saw it and she looked to see if she had thrown a book out her window to catch someone we already knew this i hope you can hear this chapter five we're never gonna get through this okay how many chapters are there again (laughs) 13 i think it gets faster like look how short that is So now Stevie's comparing herself to Jack and Rose from the Titanic because like them, she's doing what she had to do. Then she says that there was plenty of room for both of them and Jack was clearly murdered. Room doesn't mean the door would still float with the weight. Like if they both got on that door, that door would sink. That's the whole point. He tries to climb up there originally and it starts like tipping over and sinking. So he sacrifices himself, which also isn't murder. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's true. There's a lot of Rose haters out there for that, but... I agree with you. Also, I mean, they're not real. Like, the Titanic's real, but Jack and Rose aren't. They're fictional characters. They're love story and stuff. Like, they might be real characters, but that's not what really happened to them. Right. I digress. She's stupid. By the way, random. <laughs> oh, good. I said, wasn't Edward King supposed to call her the next day? Like, I remember from the last book, after the video, David, he calls her and is like, uh, if you can't do the job, I'll find someone who can. I'll call you tomorrow. And we're like weeks of like a week after this. And we never hear about this phone call. Plot hole. This is like plot Swiss cheese. Yeah. Stevie's writing back to Ellingham and hears on the radio that there's about to be the biggest blizzard in 20 years. Big who cares, but plot is what my notes say. She talks about the moose sign again, but never actually seeing a moose. Jermaine finds Stevie and then is asking her reporter questions about David. Nothing new, nothing important. Janelle makes a Rube, Rube, what is it? Rube Goldberg? Yep. And had to read every single detail of it. I had to read every single, like literally it's like the spoon triggered the blah, 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 da, 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 da. It literally talks about the whole thing. This triggers Stevie to think about where do you look for someone who's never really there? And I have an all caps, literally nothing. So I can't tell you what happened in this chapter because I just wrote nothing. April 4th, 1936, Dottie follows Frankie and Eddie, which takes 10 years. Long story short, she finds the photos that Frankie dropped. She stores them in a red tin and the tin's Dottie's. Okay, so does that mean that she was the one that was in Ellie's room? Is that what we were saying earlier? Because that's where they found it, right? Ellie had it, but I don't know how Ellie got it. Like, Ellie could have been in Stevie's old room the year before or something. Or maybe, like, whoever was in Stevie's room the previous year found it. It never talks about it. All right, got it. So, and that's supposed to be like, oh, my God. Who cares? Chapter six. I spent half the chapter for Stevie to fail to remember the message on her wall. (laughs) Then... Dun, dun, dun. David calls. And I said, okay, WTF. She says that he was the first person she ever kissed and did other stuff with. And I said, that literally never happened. Like, she says it's the first time they're making out and rolling around on her floor. No, they only kiss. It says that, like, specifically. But now, now we're misremembering things. So he literally calls and says nothing. He doesn't say where he is, what his plan is, or anything. He just says, hi, I'm not dead. Bye, basically. It's pointless. It's five pages of pointless. Then there's a blizzard warning issued for Burlington and the surrounding area. Storm due to arrive in 48 hours. Accumulations up to 24 inches. Not incest. (laughs) Extracted. Darn you, autocorrect. (laughs) Chapter 7. See, like, how fast this is going. It says, that's it. I'm completely done with Stevie. She's talking crap about the Great Gatsby, and she's only read a few chapters. (gasps) Then she finds out there's a murder at the end of the book, and now she's interested. I'm so mad. Guess what book we should cover next? <laughs> Anyways, Great Gatsby's a good book. Okay, so Senator Edward King, they just see like a news article, announces his presidential run, and everyone's mad for no reason. I said, that's why the voting age is 18. Because uh, we, we briefly talked about this. So he's from Pennsylvania, and all the other kids are from various areas like... Janelle's from Chicago, and I think Vi's from, like, West Coast, whatever. So let me ask this. How many 16-year-olds or 17-year-olds do you know are mad about senators of a specific state when they're not even voting age? 
I mean, right. And they're talking about him making a presidential run, which obviously, like, that would make more of a difference. But, but, but like, he's a- just announcing a run. So, like, there could be, like, 20 people that, like, might run for president. But, like, they make a huge deal out of it, which is a little weird. And everyone knows literally everything about him. It's super weird. So, anyways, Stevie is in Dr. Quinn's class, and they're discussing The Great Gatsby. And Dr. Quinn is talking to Stevie, and Stevie takes it as a warning not to get killed because she's so freaking important. Another wasted chapter. April 20th, 1936, Flora and Leo are talking about... Oh, this is about a week after the kidnapping. Leo asks who the father of Alice is. Leo looks out the window, and he's like, how could I have not seen it before? It's George Marsh's kid. React. Uh, I mean, why, like, I have, I we've have, already made, like, a big Marsh reveal, but now all of a sudden, like, he's, like, this underlying person in, like, literally everything in the book, and it's just, like, just listen to a this. little extra. Yeah, it is. So, she says that they just, like, hooked up a few times, and she never told him that she was pregnant or anything. So, he doesn't know. And I said, side note, when they're on the boat, he tells Albert he knows about Alice, but I guess he might not have known, or, like, he might have found out between now and then, or whatever. Anyways, just whatever. We'll get there. But I said, now it's pointless because of three things. One of three things. Alice either, either, whatever. Alice was killed in 1936. The whole book is pointless. Two, Marsh found her and raised her because it's his daughter. But that means he knew the truth. And why lie to Albert right before you kill both of you? Like, you know, it's not going to end well. So just be like, I'm really her dad. Or three, Marsh didn't know and random keep people kept her alive, which makes no sense because they never asked for more ransom. So what would be the point of keeping Alice alive? Chapter eight. Hunter's going to stay in Ellie's old room because his bum leg. So they don't want him going upstairs. I don't know if that's going to be relevant, but that's the room he's in. He admits that he didn't know Fenton very well and living and he didn't like living with her and was ready to go home to Florida. I don't know if that's important, but I'm just saying it. So Stevie invites him to Janelle's demonstration. Stevie drones on for three pages about how she's amazing and worthwhile and solved the crime of a century. It's supposed to be character development, like the main character discovers their true self and purpose, but it's poorly written and just sounds self-centered and a waste of time. I mean, honestly, it just sounds like Stevie has a crazy low self-esteem and like, it's like trauma bonding. Totally, totally trauma bonding. Trauma bonding to David. We had a conversation about that. Okay, Stevie and Hunter are at Janelle's presentation. Jermaine wants to interview Hunter about the fire and the death of Fenton, but Janelle starts a presentation before she can start asking questions. Stevie thinks about how magnetic her connection is to David. That's what I'm saying. Trauma bonding. Just Google it. But then, thankfully, Janelle's project explodes and glass goes everywhere. It isn't really clear, but people are hurt, including poor Mudge. We later find out his arm is broken. I mean, <laughs> I said that so. It just long. seems like another distraction from the plot. It doesn't because it's supposed to be like whoever did this did the other stuff. Ooh, supposedly. so okay, okay. We'll so see. Like, we'll see. It's, all right, it's not confirmed. So I have. I need to insert my little bell noise. Vi is involved. I'm convinced is what it says. I said Vi would have been able to execute everything, including the sabotaging of Janelle's machine. This means they had the opportunity, but I'm not sure motive, but I'm sure it'll be revealed later and make no sense. By the way, just like a side note. So with the riddle that drives us crazy, like talk about someone who's never really there. Like Vi is like never like in the situation, but always around. That's what I would be talking about if I was talking about someone who's never really there. Right, exactly. And I say Stevie expects literally everyone other than Vi, Jermaine, Gretchen, Maris, but never ever Vi. I'm with you. Chapter nine. Well, we solved it. And I've been saying it from book one. Okay, so chapter nine, Janelle is like obviously upset that her machine malfunctioned and like injured people. And I said, or was tampered with. Like the end of the machine was to crack an egg. So she used a pink ball gun with CO2 canisters. And the canister like exploded or malfunctioned. So of course the connection is Hayes died from CO2 poisoning. So... Of course, Stevie figured it out. It has to be the same person. So wait a minute. We're just saying that the connection between two substances containing like one of the most common molecules on the planet, that, that that's what we're going to go with. That That's why we're going to connect this to a murder. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Got mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Anyways. Okay. So Stevie goes over the contents of the red tin, which I'll just go over because it's been a while. A bit of a white feather, a lipstick tube, a shiny clip. And I said, I don't remember this from before, but the contents of the box change randomly. A little enamel box that looks like a shoe, a piece of... This says ton cloth. I don't know what that was supposed to be. A piece of cloth or whatever. It's a typo. Tan maybe? Photos and a poem. Also like side note, it talks about how like in the very first book that Dottie liked to collect things because that was the whole thing when they were like, she had your lighter, Leo. Remember she like picked up stuff on the ground, glasses and shoes from like the party goers. So like all this stuff is probably other people's stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, gotcha. Okay, so Stevie tells Nate she doesn't know what to do next because this is an active case and she doesn't have access to police stuff like fingerprinting. Don't even comment. Nate suggests she tells someone. I'll let you guess how that went over with Stevie. I'm going to guess that she's going to go it alone and not tell anybody or solve this case in a normal detective fashion. Yes. You are correct, sir. So Hunter comes to them. I think I totally skipped him coming to <laughs> like live there. Okay, so he comes and shows them a headline. Another accident at Ellingham, a bat report exclusive, and it's about the machine blowing up. The next morning, all the students get a text that there's a school-wide meeting at 9 a.m. Attendance is mandatory. All classes are canceled. Please meet in the dining hall. Weather update. This is like all seems random, but like people are showing each other text messages throughout the book. Up to 36 inches with high wind, snow will begin tomorrow morning. Stevie fails to confront Jermaine. This is in the cafeteria and it's awesome. So Jermaine says, I know Janelle is upset. I told the story. That's it. Just like you looked into Hayes' death. How did that turn out? And Stevie doesn't even say anything. She just walks away and goes back to her table. Burn. Yeah, that was really bad. Love it. So Headmaster Charles announces that they'll be shutting down the school for the remainder of the semester. There's like a lot of stuff that we don't care about. Their credits will transfer. Who cares? Travel arrangements are already being made and everyone will get a text message of when they're leaving and stuff. And they're trying to get everyone out before the blizzard hits and then they're going to like ship the rest of their belongings or whatever and i said i'm sure conveniently the main characters will still be there it's true that's what happens so stevie thinks about all the lasts as they walk back to minerva this is the last time i'll scan my card my thought is what about hunter like what the heck is he supposed to do so anyways i said side annoying no oh good Stevie keeps mentioning a line from The Great Gatsby that Dr. Quinn mentioned a few chapters back, so we're going to read it because it might become important at some point. He must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing a rose is and how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. Don't talk about my alley rose like that. Okay, so they're walking back to Minerva and Pix stayed back to do teacher things or whatever. So they, being Stevie, Janelle, Nate, Hunter, and Vi, get back to Minerva and Dave is just chilling on the couch. And he says, miss me, shut the door, not a lot of time. I mean, that's quite the greeting. Like after the last time that he talked to her was just like, oh, hey, I'm alive, bye. Oh yeah, I forgot about the phone call. Like, he seems like he's trying to go, like, secret agent man here, and he it's is. just like... It's stupid. You're Pointless. a kid. He's, like, 17. Okay, so well, I'm moving on. September 1936. The lake is being drained because the psychic said Alice might be in there, whatever. So this is probably, like, I don't know, like, two months after the kidnapping, and that dollhouse arrives, and Albert's, like, freaking out. He's so excited about it. And this for whatever reason, moves Flora to tell Marsh that he's Alice's dad. Like, just the two of them. And it says, the end of the section is, like Marsh says, he had always wanted to find Alice. I say, why? But in that moment, the task had become his sole focus in life. I don't know. Big who cares. Let's move on. Chapter 10. Oh, okay. David shuts off the security system that his dad set up temporarily. So I'm going to let you read this page. I want you to tell me if this could actually work. Okay, so I read the pages, and essentially, David says that he shut down the security system by putting in a second base station, which is like the controller for all of these security cameras, which in theory makes sense, but it makes what he did way more complicated than it needed to be, because if he already had a profile on there, he could just, as an admin, he could just go in to any of the cameras, plug a laptop in, and shut it down from there. But what he says makes sense. It kind of works. It's 
a little bit of a stretch because people would see that there was an extra person that they didn't know on it. And it would be really weird that there were all these holes in the camera footage. But besides that, like it checks. By the way, I'm an IT guy, so like that's kind of my credential for this. But, you know, if anybody has anything to say about it, that's fine. I doubt it. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for that analysis. Welcome to my TED Talk. Okay, so um, <laughs> so this whole time we've been screaming, asking why Edward King is so evil. So this is what we get from David. This is a quote. Someone who uses racist policies to hurt or kill people. Someone who could do untold damage to the environment. And someone who could start an illegal war to distract from his political problems. Don't get too political, but go ahead. No, I mean, like, I feel like... I say it's very vague and unrealistic, but okay. You know, I'd like to think that if we're talking about, like, Edward King, like, doing all of this, like, unchecked just because, like, all of a sudden he's going to be president or whatever, it's like... You know, I don't think that this is the platform that he's running on. Hey, I'm going to go start a bunch of wars and burn down the trees. Illegally. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like a bunch of teenagers act like they're saving the world because Hitler is about to become president. Like, I don't understand. This is not how this works. <clears throat> Anyways, so that stuff would be bad. I'm just saying I don't believe that's what's happening. So anyways, David shows up with flash drives that he stole from his dad's secret safe and computers and tablets, and he wants all of them to read through the flash drives to stop the above-mentioned person from becoming president. He wants everyone to miss their transportation and get stuck in the storm. So they agree to help because it's for the greater good and the right thing to do. I roll is what I have. Chapter 11. They're going to take the woods like secretly to the gym and hide out until the storm gets too bad. And then Hunter stays behind at Minerva to distract picks. But I'm also assuming like with his leg issue, it'd be hard for him to navigate the snow. Also, he's like a pointless character at this point. So like they don't want to bring him along. Oh, by the way, so they're walking to the gym and it's already snowed like three inches, but it literally told us a chapter ago that it would begin the next morning. But whatever, we can't keep our theories straight. I said, this part of the book fits perfectly with the rest of the series with all its inconsistencies. Nate says to Stevie that he only came along because whenever they, being Stevie and David, get together, something bad always happens to Stevie. Okay, Vi and Janelle go upstairs because that's where the costumes, I guess, in the pool house are kept. And they presumably have a fight. David explains to Nate and Stevie what happened. He planned for Stevie to see him get a beat up, etc. This would make his dad lay off for a few days since David seemed off his rocker, apparently. I don't even understand why that would work. Then David had his friend drive him two states away to sneak into his house to get the flash drives. So you're telling me that he lives with his dad near Stevie and she never knew about him, but he supposedly like doesn't talk to his dad either because of the stuff that happened with his mom. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like It just seems like they would have run into each other at some point. Or like the whole thing about how David said, that's when I stopped messing with my dad or whatever. You live with him. So anyways, David sneaks back to Ellingham and here we are. So Vi and Dave, like they come down or whatever and Vi and Janelle are still mad at each other. And Vi and David start looking through the flash drives. Janelle refuses. Nate says he'll pass for now. And David tells Stevie it would probably be best if she didn't help. And I said, what's the point of bringing all of them there if like only one other person is helping you look through this? Because he says he needs more people helping. And I said, I literally don't care about Edward King and what he's hiding or whatever. <laughs> So you're basically saying that he drug all these people out in the snowstorm and didn't even ask them if they were going to help him first. They're just all existing there. The, and he know. said he didn't have enough time to read through it by himself, but he literally has one person helping him who probably is a murderer. So February 18th, 1937, it's New York City. Marsh is at a bar looking for two guys named Andy Delvecco, Delvecco? and Jerry Castrelli. Sorry. So now all of a sudden, Alice never went for car rides, like he says. So it was like unusual that she was there, which not true. Okay. But anyways, nothing really comes from him asking around. He sleeps in an apartment there and is thinking about how things should have gone and like the time he did spend with Alice, like not realizing it was his daughter. And then he mentions that it would be easy to keep a kid hidden and I said, I thought I misread it because my daughter was two once and she would blow their cover so fast and tell the world she was kidnapped. Yeah, I mean, like... Could you imagine? Th this this seems to be, like, She's written from the pers 
written from the perspective of somebody that like definitely doesn't have a three-year-old that never <laughs> closes their mouth. So anyways, he wakes up to a postcard under his door and it's a picture of Rock Point, which is the second money drop where they lowered it off the cliff into the boat. And it reads, keep your mouth shut if you want her. Big who cares? <laughs> Chapter 12. So it's the next morning and everyone heads back to Minerva and like side note, because it doesn't make any sense, but they spent like 20,000 chapters talking about how, not chapters, pages, how cold it was and like how they were all soaked from like going through the blizzard and stuff. And then like later on, it's like, no, just kidding. You'll see. So anyways, Pix is reasonably pissed off and glad they're all there. They all have to call their parents and Stevie's surprised her parents aren't mad. And Pix is like, surprise, surprise. Your parents just want you to be safe and love you. So stop being angsty. <laughs> It's true, though. So before Stevie goes to bed, she looks out her window because she feels like she's being watched. She doesn't see anything and goes to bed. And then this is a quote from the book. She did not see the figure that reemerged from the shadow of a tree just outside. I said, okay, I hate this for several reasons. So all of a sudden, we changed the writing style. Like before, we always had to wait for Stevie to figure things out. We weren't just told things. It's always from a character's perspective. But now we, the readers, know there was a figure out there, but Stevie doesn't. Like, why? And then it says, too, it just spent the whole chapter telling me how bad the weather is and how cold the kids were getting back to Minerva, but some rando is just chilling outside Stevie's window for no reason. Maybe it's a damn moose. <laughs> That Stevie's never seen. I mean, I just feel like the the writing style just like kind of fits the moment, doesn't it? It's just like, okay, well, you know, right now it feels good for the plot for her there to be a mysterious figure outside of her door. <laughs> but but yeah, like, but it's always let's wait for Stevie. Let's have someone tell us. But now all of a sudden we know someone's watching her in an like inconceivable blizzard. <laughs> I mean, I feel like in the past, we've learned this stuff from the 1937 stuff where it's like, okay, this past, you know, timeline tells us something and that and then we have to follow Stevie while she figures out the same thing. But now we're just like, you know, out of the ether, you know, we're being talked to as a reader instead of like following along with the story, which is a little weird. I literally hate it. I was enraged. Chapter 13. There's a lot of yearning and aching, and I'll just skip past that. <laughs> okay, so Stevie goes up to David's bedroom, and this part was super weird. So he jokes about making out. He's like, if we're going to make out, we might as well just do it. And then she goes, could we? And he's like, no, we couldn't. It's weird. It's so awkward and weird. So she asked why he wouldn't let her look through the files. And he basically is like, I opened up to you and you lied about your deal with my dad. And that sucks. And I don't trust you. And then he jabs her with this great quote. You want to solve the great crimes of the past. So everyone will think you're Nancy Drew. And in the process, what? Ellie dies and dot, dot, dot. And he stops herself and tells her to go back downstairs. It's fantastic. I was here for it. Yeah. I mean, like all of this stuff is not directly her fault but like she's messing with stuff she's a butt (laughs) february 24th 1937 george finds jerry which is like one of the people that he was asking around about that's like okay so the first the two guys i don't think i explained this are the two guys he hired Mm. to help with the kidnapping so he finds one of them jerry and he ties him up and gets him in his car it's like a whole drawn out thing so jerry says that he could never kill a kid and they didn't mean to kill the woman being iris They shot her in the head and dumped her in a lake, so I don't know how that's an accident. But then Jerry claims that they beat up George during the drop-off. That was Andy's idea. That's the other guy he hired. So Jerry says that Alice is alive and with a nice family up in the mountains on the other side of the lake, the New York side. They told the family that it was his kid sister and they were trying to keep her out of trouble. He can't remember where the cabin it was exactly, so Marsh pulls out a map and tells him to look. And that's the end. That's where we we stop. I guess that's a good cliffhanger now, isn't it? But like, yeah, like, oh, I don't know where this place was, but it's like family, right? No, it's like random people, a family. Oh, just a family. But still, that's just took her up in the mountains, dropped her off with a nice looking family, you know. But like, why? Why would I get I can't kill a kid, but it's like you don't have to. You can get someone. There's a third person supposedly involved. And you shot Iris in the head, probably in front of her daughter, and dumped her in a lake. And that wasn't too hard. Okay, do you have any lingering questions, theories, whatever? I didn't write any down, so. I mean, 
I guess I just kind of, I mean, obviously it's like all the stuff that we've been wondering since the beginning. I mean, we've talked about that, but you know, I, I feel like what's the next thing that Marsh did that's going to pop up. That's going to be like a story changer or, you know, something like that. But so here's my thing. So like my main lingering question is I have two. Why did Marsh lie to Albert like on the boat before they exploded? He's like, I even know about Alice, but he didn't, he could have just been like, I know I'm her dad and I found her and this is what happened. And like, I feel like the only reason that's not said is because like, we're not supposed to find that out yet, but it doesn't make any sense if you know you're going to die to lie about it. That doesn't make any sense at all. And then like the second thing is like, what could be on these files about Albert or not Albert, uh, what's his name? Edward King or whatever. It's like, why do I even care about a politician in Pennsylvania? Like, why do these kids care? Like, why does this matter? And, like, if you're so worried about him becoming president, enough people like him. Like, what about that? Like, can we talk about that for five seconds? Like, you guys think you're saving the world, but the world can't save itself by voting. And, like, what's on there that, like, cause him to kill someone who's lurking in the woods or whatever? I, it's, my lingering question just blew up, but, like, I'm frustrated. Yeah, I, like, feel your frustration. I think that there's. Why do I care is my real question. Why should I care about any of this? Like, even if Alice is alive and the will should go to her and not the school. Why do I care? Why do I care if the school's making a nicer art barn for them with the money that should go to Alice? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's kind of been the question from the beginning is like, you know, it's not that like a case like this shouldn't be solved, but it's like, you know, Stevie's making all these discoveries that Don't that aren't solved because there's nobody around anymore that like it really makes that much of a difference to. So what's your theory about like Edward King and what's on the flash drives? I mean, we've already talked about like Edward King being like connected to Eddie, to Eddie which, you know, that's probably something that's like going to come up. And I don't know. I mean, I'm with you on the whole, Hey, Edward King is like, should is all evil and stuff like that. Like to these kids and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, it's not like demeaning. It's not like, Oh, I don't care about your opinion. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you're talking about like something that just doesn't make any difference to what is happening to what's happening in the book. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't track the plot. Like Edward King could be any sort of like evil person in this book. He could be like, A mob boss that doesn't want, you know, his, like, heritage found out and stuff like that could mess him up. It could be, like, you know, a businessman that doesn't want dirt to go out to other people. Like, he could be, like, any, like, evil character archetype, but they just, like, chose politician. And then they... some sort of beef. Yeah. The author has a beef with politicians. I mean, yeah. But, like, it just feels like the politician choice was a little, like... It made things more complicated than it needed to be. It didn't need to be a politician. And it's super boring. Like, super, super boring. Like, I don't care about it at all. Yeah. So, like, and also, like, oh, I just keep information that could ruin me on flash drives. Why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, obviously, like, it could be somewhere else, but, like, you're keeping Why are you extra keeping cop- it at all? You're keeping an extra copy that's really close to you, like, Why in, keep your, it? in your house. Yeah. Why keep it at all? Like, I don't, even, even if he's related to Eddie, oh, the Truly Devious letter, they didn't murder anybody. So why would it even matter? Okay. Side note, <laughs> after next episode, which I'm going to do by myself, the final, will finally be done with this nonsense. We're going to do like a bonus episode that is however long, probably like 20 minutes. And we're just going to talk about all three books and like our anger or frustration, because I'm sure the ending is going to be wildly unnecessary and doesn't make any sense so we're just gonna do a bonus episode so you have that to look forward to but next week i'll be doing part two by my lonesome mm. so in closing as always thanks for listening you can find me on instagram and facebook at the job reader podcast let me know if you liked having my first mate along for the voyage because he can join us for some other episodes subscribe so you can instantly download the next episode if you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review to help other crewmates find this podcast. Share with everyone you know. Stay tuned for your weekly dose of secondhand embarrassment, which is going to be <laughs> extensive via the outtakes. And would you like to add anything before I close this out? So, yeah. Um, just last thing on the book. I just, 
I don't want. This is not the place for it. Well, I just want to say, like, I like I like the plot of this book. I think that the plot is interesting, and I don't want this to come off as like, oh, this book is just horrible. Like, the plot's not bad. It's just getting there that's tough. But I want to thank you for having me on here, and I think that this was really fun, and I hope that we can do this again sometime. Mm. Okay, so I'll talk to you next week for part two of the Hand on the Wall. Until we sail again, this has been the Jolly Reader. Bon voyage! Do you want to do the hey, we made it to the outtakes part? Sure. You can do it. Hey, made it to the outtakes. Let's do it. (laughs) Okay, so she comes out of the bathroom. Literally, the outtakes are going to be 20 minutes long. (laughs) Okay. Testing! See, I'm, wait, look, I want to show you this. So, like, that was really loud, and this is, like, normal level, maybe even a little louder when I get hyped about Stevie. So now you try to talk into it. Here's what it says. Testing. I'm really nervous about this, and I don't want to. Look how quiet. Get closer. I'm a little nervous about (laughs) this, and I don't want to disappoint my wife. (laughs) That was better. Let's listen to it. Oh, I can't find the mouse. (laughs) (gasps) (gasps) insert like what is that that deep breath pages 179 or no (laughs) pages 1 through 179 chapters 1 through 13 and is there anything oh this is i'm supposed to ask you this it's in cut out letters so it might be like hard to read and you have to turn the page you want me to hold it just lean in here look at yeah Look how loud this is. I'm going to have to like tune that down. Okay. So anyways, uh, Alice, Alice, Stevie solves the impossible riddle. riddle. Why can't I talk? Restart. I just drilled the mic. So Stevie tells Nate that she's not okay, but in a weird way, she's awesome. And oh, what? What is this? Okay. Let me reread this note. Sorry. Oh, like. Yeah, like I, I just feel like I can't even follow my notes. I need Mike. Charles will never get through this. We keep doing this. So Charles and Stevie talk about how it for like ten hours. I know it. I should smack the mic. Um this episode's gonna be two hours long. Just skip it. It's probably pointless. You probably just won't listen to the next one. So Larry tells we're like giggling little kids. <laughs> okay. St- st- left the burner on and then sunshine she better not be getting that bunny josh is gonna go check on sunshine sweet don't get too excited just read this like that thing lean in david oh no what we gonna do the king likes daniel oh that's daniel (laughs) dang it okay so anyway so so just some context for this next outtake. I actually like yelled the F bomb, which I don't curse like ever and slip up. So on the podcast, I mean, of course. So when I was talking to Josh, I just like yelled it. So this is my reaction after the fact. Whoa, got to edit that out. <laughs> I was looking at you and I was talking Nora. <laughs> oh, no. I've never done that. <laughs> I've literally never done that. I looked at you and I was just like, this is like a mess. Okay. I'm crying. Okay. Chapter eight. (laughs) Say it louder for the people in the back. You're my official reader. Of course. Page 124. That's way too far. Let's see. Oh, I was like, where is it? It's this like italics. What was the thing we were talking about a rose earlier? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Because I remember thinking, that's Allie's name. Because is that supposed to be connected? Stop it! Stop boofing! (laughs) So anyways. um, So Nate says to Stevie, oh, this is the very end? No, it's not. My stuff better have saved. Hold on a second. This is not my full note. Okay, we had some technical difficulties. I, like, can't even read this. Okay. Um, 
Should I just save this? Move it over? Okay. Pause. Okay, right, moving along. Let's see here. Davy tells Davy. I am Allie, and you are with me to my mom.